Hello, thank you for joining the Plan Mecca Digital Mastery Series. My name is Lydia Nadolsky, and I'm the Senior Marketing Manager for Plan Mecca USA. With us today is Siobhan Healy, and her topic is Peri-Implantitis, Top Three Major Issues from a Professional and At-Home Maintenance Standpoint. Before we begin, I have a few housekeeping items. If you experience technical issues, please submit your issues in the chat function. If you have questions for Siobhan, please submit via the Q&A function, and those questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. We anticipate today's presentation to take approximately 50 minutes, and we'll, we will then open to questions so we will complete at the hour. Additionally, we are recording the webinar and you will be sent the link early next week. At the end, there will be a post-webinar CE survey via chat, and it will also be sent to you via email early next week. You must complete the survey to receive the CE verification. Without further ado, I would like to introduce Siobhan Healy. Good afternoon, everyone. I am honored to be here with you on this evening. I first want to just thank Plan Mecca for thinking of me and inviting me on here to help educate our colleagues all over the world. So wherever you're tuning in from, thank you so much. And I am, again, just honored to be able to team up with Plan Mecca to be here because um, like Plan Mecca, I too believe that better care can be achieved through innovation. So thank you. As much as I hate talking about myself, I feel it is important to short, share a little bit of my journey in dentistry so that you can understand how I came to practice as implant care practitioner in oral surgery, um, caring for patients with full mouth implant rehabilitation. So I'm originally from the Boston area, which is actually where I am today. I just came home yesterday to see my family. I haven't seen them in a long time. Um, but in 2010, I moved to Washington, DC, and that is where I both um, live and practice. So I, um, I grew up uh, out of, uh, right outside of Boston in a small town called Revere, Massachusetts. If you've ever flown into Logan Airport or have ever visited Revere Beach or perhaps drove in over the, uh, driven over the Tobin Bridge, you have, um, you've been in my neighborhood, so welcome. I am a 2006 phone school of dental hygiene graduate, which is something um, I like like to stress because phone school of dental hygiene was the first dental hygiene school um, established in the world. Uh, in 2014, 15, it's all a blur now, um, maybe even sooner than that, I finished a master's degree and I just recently joined phone school of dental hygiene as a part-time virtual adjunct instructor. When I moved to Washington, D.C., I almost immediately got involved in leadership. I am the immediate past president of the District of Columbia Dental Hygiene Association, and I am also a delegate on the national level representing um, District of Columbia at the um, annual ADHA House of Delegates. And 2015 was where I've had a lot of life-changing things in, in my, my career as a hygienist, but in 2015 was really when it took the cake because that's when I started my journey as implant care practitioner in oral surgery. And that is a role that um, led to me being um, non, uh, uh, nominated and then awarded um, the uh, top six, recently I was just named of Dimensions of Dental Hygiene's top six dental hygienists you should know clinical practice and um, it has everything to do with what I'm doing in oral surgery. So before we jump into the meat and potatoes that I know everybody is, is waiting for, I want to just say, make a statement um, about evidence-based practice. And we know that is important and it's really, we should be making evidence-based decisions in everything that we do, not just when we are in the office. So we have to consider um, when it comes to literature, when it comes to the research, we have to consider the quantity because there's so much stuff out there, right? But it's important to be able to understand how to read the research so that you can sift through the quantity for the quality and then make your judgments. Because I can tell you right now that when it comes to uh, implant maintenance, I've been kind of 
I've definitely been all over the country and just recently I, I started traveling the world. Um, but the consensus is, but is, is just about the same. And, and when it comes to implant maintenance and the best practices, we need more research. So I'm not gonna spend the next 50 minutes regurgitating research uh, to you. I instead want to share my experience as implant care practitioner in oral surgery. So what is evidence-based dentistry? Well, we know that it's using the best science to make the, to make the right decisions for our patients, to make the best decisions for our patients. And to go a little bit deeper into it, it's the cautious use of the best current evidence in making decisions about the care of the individual patient. Evidence-based practice also integrates clinical expertise and takes patients' desires, values, and needs into consideration. And I can promise you that when it when we talk about implant dentistry in any aspect, whether it's surgical, restorative, laboratory, um, you've got to really take into consideration the clinical expertise because right now it holds more weight than um, the literature. So we're here today to talk about, this is really one of my favorite things to present on, and that is peri-implant disease, the three major key issues from a professional and at-home maintenance standpoint. Um, as a dental hygienist, I can say that oftentimes our voices and our opinions are, some, um, of, are somewhat silenced. But um, why is it important to be here today? The future of dentistry, okay? And if we take a look at the, some of the stats that come from the global dental markets um, or the research markets, it is projected that by 2024, the implant markets are forecasted to reach 6.81 billion. It's, it, it, it's a, we know it's a growing market. And guess what? It's, in 20, we're, it's 2020 right now. So the future is here. We're living the future. The future is right now. And implants are the standard of care for the replacement of missing teeth. And ironically, at the same time, Implantitis remains a global concern with an emphasis on maintenance. And again, it doesn't really matter what um, conference, what symposium you go to, the center is maintenance. It's all about hygiene. Um, I attended the 2017 um, International Dental Implant Association Symposium where I met um, Pincus Adar, who is a master um, uh, uh, ceramist. And he gave a beautiful presentation and he talked about the future of dentistry. And he says the, f the future of dentistry is to redo dentistry. And I'm telling you, in my experience, the future of dentistry is right now. So when you act with compassion, you will never be wrong. And experience will give you the confidence and power to the uh, uh, experience will give you the confidence and power to be you, doesn't it? And when I started diving deeper, when I when I um, started working in oral surgery, and I was meeting and, and given the responsibility to care for patients that had dentistry that I have never seen before. I was not taught. No hygienist is taught in hygiene school how to care for patients. With, um, with implant dentistry. And so I started, I had, to, I had to go out there and figure it out on my own. And the dental hygiene conferences weren't giving me the right information because I was taking recommendations and trying to apply it to my practice and it wasn't practical. So I had no to start um, following the dentists around that were actually redoing dentistry or um, treating peri-implantitis. So I attended this amazing life-changing symposium in 2017 and I learned three things and that is implantitis is the main reason for implant failure. The endpoint goal of treatment is that the patient and the dental hygiene practitioner must be able to maintain the area and most importantly I learned how to, I learned a non-surgical approach to treating peri-implant disease. So let's jump into the major key issues and let's start with the first one, okay? Implantitis is a global concern. And I think that the approach to implant dentistry, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what area of practice you are in, but you have to, you have to approach implant dentistry um, with these three things in mind. And I like to put the picture of the 2008 NBA um, champions, the Boston Celtics, because at that time we called them the big three. So these are, these are big major things. So the first one is dental implants are not teeth. 
Implant dentistry is a prosthetic option for tooth replacements for tooth replacement with several components. Sorry, sometimes I, I have so much information. I speak fast. I got a lot to share with you. I'm going to try to slow down. But this quote was originally made by um, Dr. Uh, uh, the late Carl Misch. And where you see several, it used to say surgical, but I feel like implant dentistry has several components. Implant dentistry is mathematical, it's, bio, it's, it's about biology, um, and you have to be on point in all four of these areas, surgical, laboratory, re restorative, maintenance. And then under surgical, laboratory, and restorative, there are also components. And these are things that I learned um, practicing alongside um, an oral surgeon. So the second most important thing to remember is that dental implants replace already missing teeth. We are um, forgetting that and not exhausting all of the options before we extract that tooth. And this is hurting us um, because in many cases, sometimes it's a, it's a um, issue of periodontal disease, which is treatable. For example, this is a patient that was referred to me really in oral surgery because he has a um when i say dental fair i mean he's even petrified of hygienists so he came to this office because he knew that um, we could provide um non-surgical uh periodontal therapy under um sedation iv sedation so but he was referred to our office also for full mouth extractions this is periodontal disease. Yes, he has some caries. Yes, he needs some restorative uh, work, but this is periodontal disease. And the patient doesn't want to lose any more teeth. Uh, and so that's, that's not our business. You know, our business is to do whatever we need to do to meet the patient's needs. And I say, nothing replaces, um, nothing is better than your natural tooth. So the first thought should be to save the teeth. Because patients with um, dental implants are susceptible to infection, especially when they have a history of periodontal disease. So another um, explanation as to why implantitis is a global concern is because there's a misunderstanding about peri-implant tissue, how to diagnose it, how to probe it, how to, you know, how often should we do this? How often should we do that? We're still in conversation about it. But when you have a um, misunderstanding of every of peri implant tissue, what happens? You have a misdiagnosis, right? Or a missed diagnosis. So let's look at this example right here. Now, if you are a dental hygienist, um, I'll just use myself as an example. Um, in 2015, when I first started in um, oral surgery, I had some knowledge, but obviously not where I am today, but the old um, uh, um, unskilled, um, uneducated self would have looked at this periapical film and would have said, geez, the bone level is supposed to be somewhere up here, right? By like the CEJ, like a, like a natural tooth. Um, and then I later learned that you know, bone starts to remodel about you know, one, uh, uh, the, down to the first thread I just recently read not too long ago that actually that is that theory is being debunked. Um, and in reality, the, you know, the bone is the bone is down here. And then depending on what kind of probe you're using, the probing pressure um, and what you actually understand about the purpose in probing when it comes to dental implants, I mean, that can give you a whole different discrepancy as well. But the truth about this particular patient was um, this patient came to the office on December 26 of um, 2019. She wasn't having any symptoms. She was, for, she was in for her maintenance appointment and the hygienist saw that this implant was mobile, pus exudate. Again, patient had no symptoms. So as you can see, it needed to be explanted. But I talked with the doctor about um, uh, um, decontaminating the implant surface through the use of um, glycine powder and a powder streaming device and um, doing some bone grafting because I had learned in these symposiums, I, I've learned, I saw, um, you know, 
somewhere as like 30, 40 year follow ups of doctors uh, not explanting, but actually decontaminating the implant surface, bone grafting, and then, um, you know, achieving long term stability. So this is a this is my point of this was not only can we, should we be giving our patients the option of the non-surgical or surgical approach to peri-implantitis, but if you are lacking the knowledge, you may have looked at that original picture that I first showed and thought that there was a problem, right? When in all actuality, this is an ailing implant now, meaning that it has bone loss, but without pocketing, there's no progression um, and it's static at maintenance visits. So this is the kind of critical thinking that is necessary if you are a clinician um, maintaining patients with, with dental implants. So this is nothing new. We all know about the proceedings of the World Workshop that took place, um, I believe it was in 2018 and finally published in 2019. But what they did was they added um, two more categories and that is um, peri-implant health and peri-implant soft and hard tissue deficiencies. But my question is, do we as hygienists who are given the responsibility of diagnosing uh, disease, intervening and so on and so on, do we even know what a peri-implant soft and hard tissue deficiency is? Do we know what it might look like? And do we know that it's something that we can't treat? So when it comes to the classification, this is, a tradition, this is how we traditionally uh, classify periodontal disease. And it's not enough when, when it comes to all of the different um, complications and the different degrees of peri-implantitis that we're seeing around patients with implants. So I encourage you, if you haven't already, take a look at this um, paper that was published in the 2017 National Journal of Oral Biology and Cranial Facial Research. And I know that some of the papers that came from the World, um, World Workshop Proceedings also brought attention to this and awareness to this. So basically, this paper is saying that, you know, really, there's no standard classification for peri-implant de defects. And we need to be more specific and detailed um, about what we're seeing it. Um, uh, is it an intra, you know, intra-bony defect? circumferential, the shape, things like that. So this offers a standard of classification or su suggests a standard of classification for implant defects that require um, more detail. And not only that, but this paper also says that you need both clinical and um, radiographs to make an appropriate uh, determination. It has another paper. Um, this one came out in 2016 in the International Journal of Periodontics and Restorative Dentistry. Now they're talking about classifying it based off the, the etiology. So first we have, we need to be more descriptive about the defect. Now we need to be um, considering the, the cause, okay, why, why it occurred. And this, I think, is one of my favorite things to talk about, um, you know, operator-induced peri-implant disease. And this paper says that um, in the future, peri-implantitis may be defined by the causative etiology, right? And, and clinical error is one of them. Practitioner error is one of them. Um, but this is important because it will allow for better communication, understanding of the pathogenesis, the recommending therapy and anticipation of the prognosis. And like I said, something like this is important for dental hygienists because there's not much that we can do when it's a situation of disease because of the way an implant was, had, was placed, for example. But I want to draw your attention to this table one that I took right out of the paper. And the first circle where it talks about, or the first row where it talks about how the origin is peri-implantitis induced by pathogenic bacteria slash biofilm. And then an example, it says plaque biofilm. So it's describing those two things different, uh, you know, in their own category. They're not the same. In my opinion, plaque is what you can see on the patient's teeth. We don't ever want it to get to a point where biofilm develops into plaque 
because that means we have, you know, we're failing our patients and our patients are failing themselves. So we need to understand that our, um, we need to understand and recognize biofilm. Also, if you take a look at the third row down, it talks about um, uh, 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 itrogenic factors. And um, examples of this are, you know, directly related to, to Operator Ever. Uh, the examples that it gave was buccal implant placement, um, inadequate inter-implant distance. Um, all, like I said, it's mathematical and there's biology behind it. Um, and then the bottom here, now this, this paper was uh, the, the case that they used in this paper, it says that this particular patient um, uh, was a gross failure because she had not been to um, the dentist since she completed her work. So it had been five years since she's seen a dentist. We're responsible for that. I'd like to know if it was communicated to the patient, um, the dedication to um, maintenance appointments, not only professionally or at home. We've been telling our patients that they are bionic after they have their implants placed and they're not. I'm gonna pause that so that I'm not talking over the, the Halloween music, but um, I, I put the, the difference between ideogenic and idiopathic here on the screen because the um, itrogenic examples are just diseases or, disor or disorders that are, that are caused or a result of a doctor's words or actions. And that's why it's so important to remember that we have an oath because dear colleagues, peri-implantitis is a man-made disease. So we've got to remember that, you know, and we have to remember that we need to um, exercise the latest innovations because our patient's life, um, their, their, the quality of their oral health depends on it. I can't tell you what it's like to have to tell somebody who has full arch that they need the entire thing redone. CBCT, okay, 3D technology is the standard of care for implant placement, point blank period. So shout out to Plan Mecca for all that you're doing um, because dental implants are 3D and we need to be able to see that that bone three-dimensionally. And commonly, implants are placed to buckle. I was at an international conference in Australia and there was a presenter up there who says that she still uses panoramic films for implant planning and doesn't, doesn't see the need yet for, or because CBCT is not the standard of care. I got up and left the room. Um, because when you know better, you do better. So to get back to the misunderstanding of peri-implant tissue, just checking my time here. So let's talk about that a little bit more. Let's talk about what makes um, uh, gingival tissue around teeth different from tissue around uh, peri-implants. And, and that is because implants lack a self-limiting process that exists in the tissues around natural teeth. What does that mean? They lack PDL. So this is a beautiful um, image uh, given to me by one of my mentors, Dr. Marisa Rancati. And I mean, this just, it shows the difference in disease progression. Without these so necessary um, uh, PDL here to help slow down the progression, this is what protects the inflammation from the bone. And because dental implants don't have that, you know, the disease progression just boom, you know, it goes right to the bone. And even so much so that, you know, every patient is different, but some patients, it's like, you know, after a month, they, they, they have a severe case of peri-implantitis. Um, and it's always multifactorial, but I'm saying that just to give you an example that we can't say, you know, you just have a little bleeding around your implant. You know, we really got to um, um, jump on that because we know how quickly the disease can progress. So, um, looking a little bit more, um, examining the tissue uh, at the implant between the, the soft tissue and the smooth surface of the, of the abutment. This is known as the implant soft tissue interface. So inside the pocket, we have non-characterized and actually characterized um, uh, epithelium. 
We also, we also have junctional epithelium. And then we have these supercrustal zone of connected tissue, these collagen fibers that there's a textbook that describes them as figure eights, okay, that, that run circumferentially around the, um, the abutment and in the tissue. So what that does is there's no attachment, right? There's just adaption. So we know that the tissue, there's a seal there, right? We know that the tissue, um, and I just recently read in a textbook that it's almost sealed by like a, a sticky like substance. And uh, this is the controversy when it comes to probing. And also it's a controversy when it comes to flossing. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that more, but the, the main difference is attachment versus adaption. And because we have less connective tissue around the dental implant, that means what? Less blood supply, right? So all multifactorial. But in my experience in, in clinical practice, patients don't always have symptoms, man. Um, this is a 25 year old patient who got her implant when she was 18 um, in another country, but uh, she had no symptoms. And you can see the increased shininess to the tissue. You can see the tenderness, swelling, pus, exudate. And it's amazing because she's very attractive on the outside, but you know, we've got to, the, 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 we need to let our patients understand that you've got to take just as good as the inside that <laughs> you do the outside. Um, but this was a multifactorial situation. It has to do with implant placement. It has to do with the restorative design. Obviously, it has to do with her poor home care as well. And um, there is some cement there as well as some, some calculus. So here's another example of a patient. Now, this is a significant example because this patient had just come to our office from seeing their hygienist. And the patient came to us for an implant consult. Um, so that's where I stepped in to do the full mouth set of x-rays because the referring office didn't have it. I had to do a periodontal charting because the, the um, referring office didn't have it. And this is implant site number four. Okay, I, I, I barely breathed on it. Well, I wouldn't be breathing on it, right? Because I'm wearing my mask, but you get my point. I, I barely looked at it and, and it, you know, started, there was pus exudate. So let me reiterate, this patient had just come from the hygienist. So it is a specialty. Um, it, it, it does require long-term continuing education. Um, this is multifactorial, just look at it. But one of the probably main causes is the cement, the residual cement. So lesions in peri-implantitis are two to three times larger. And because of that, we need to recognize mucositis as a true pathology, as a true disease, just, just like we do gingivitis. We know so much more about the oral systemic link, um, and it's time for us to start practicing what we're preaching. So the second major key issue, let me just grab a sip of water here. Thank you. The second major key issue is, and this is a big issue, is that it's not yet in the dental hygiene curriculum, but I am here to tell you that, that that is changing. But let's talk about that a little bit more. Why is that? How is it that dental implants are the standard of care for the replacement of missing teeth? There's a huge emphasis on maintenance, um, but we are still graduating dental hygienists that are not prepared to treat um, patients today. So dental hygiene all started in 1913 um, when Dr. Alfred C. Frones uh, established the first dental hygiene program um, in Bridgeport, Connecticut at the University of Bridgeport. And I have a picture of my class in that same um, uh, stairway there. And in 1914, he graduated the first class of dental hygienists. And let me just remind you about our purpose, okay? And if you need help discovering your purpose, there's a book recommendation there for you, The Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren. But dental hygienists were not created to sit in an operatory and clean teeth every 30 to 45 minutes, okay? We are versed in the science of health and prevention of disease. Our thing is prevention. 
And it's a struggle right now because we're not regulated by dental hygienists, we're regulated by dentists. So 35 years after the, um, um, the profession was you know, born, uh, it, it took 35 years before a standard of um, uh, dental hygiene curriculum was set. And that was set or, in 1951 by the ADA Council on Dental Education. And really, um, after, you know, not too long after that, hygienists became licensed in all states and then accreditation began. And um, the accreditation standards for dental hygiene education are just the basic needs that hygiene schools or programs need to meet. Um, but it is important to be current, right, with, with the latest research and the latest practices. So we have had these standards, right, put in place by COVID. It, it, and dental hygiene is over 160, uh, it's 106 years later. So we are a profession that is 106 years old, right? And this document here is um, basically what we, our standards, it's what we, what we just, it's the standards that are, that need to be taught. And in some cases, um, that can be very basic. And it's actually left up to the institution to stay updated. Um, but my point in telling you this is that I read the, the, this um, document and this document has been revised between 2007 and 2018. It's been revised 27 times with no mention of the word dental implants. Luckily, I was recently invited to attend a um, virtual meeting for CODA and I did let them know that um, this is something that you need to consider is to adding implantology into the dental hygiene standards of education. So how did we get here? Well, dental, hyg dental hygienists had been in practice for 51 years. So we were already established before implant dentistry began. Um, when, um, uh, especially when Dr. Brainermark discovered uh, osseous integration in 1952. And in 1965 was when the first patient, a friend of his, received um, four um, machine surface titanium um, implant fixtures in his mandible that lasted the patient um, until his death, which was 40 years later. So Dr. Brainermark accidentally, he, he's not a dentist. Um, he, doesn't ha he didn't have any background in dentistry, but he accidentally discovered osseous in integration when he, he um, placed the screw in the fibia of a rabbit and was unable to remove it because it had, um, you know, the bone had um, adhered to the surface of, of the screw. So thank you, Dr. Brainermark, for your discovery. But I just also want to remind you of his purpose. And his purpose, he believed that no patient should have to go to bed with their teeth in a jar. So his purpose was for increased quality of life. And I don't see why that should be any different from what our purpose is as dental health care professionals. But you can see that implant dentistry has definitely um, um, you know, evolved uh, since the 1950s, we started with transosseal to subperiosteal to endosseous, and now you kind of see a little bit of both, right? So, but where's, where's, where's CODA been all that time, right? Now in 2020, the big thing is zygomatic implants. So if you haven't seen patients, get ready because you will. And then I was at the um, Jamaican Dental Association in February, and I got to watch Dr. Garg present on how he's bringing transosseal dental implants back. So we've got to be aware of all of these things. Um, but I'll just let you, I'll let that at sit in your brain for a minute because that's a lot. But I can tell you that 90% of all dental implant complications are due to poor implant planning, um, free-handed implant placement. Obviously, dental hygienists don't do any of these things, but here's how I think that we are. Here's how I know we are contributing to um, the rise of peri-implantitis. And again, it's because of poor skills, and that is due to lack of knowledge, lack of clinical training, 
Um, but again, that's, tr that's changing. Dental hygiene schools are um, being educated about this, especially phone school of dental hygiene, who's getting ready to implement um, implant curriculum into their, their program. Um, but you know, this is a major key issue. So let's, that leads us to the third one is because the education is the same, so doesn't the, so, so aren't the recommendations, right? Um, and intervention is, is the hot topic and it's all over the place. Um, many of us are kind of, you know, we're doing different things, using different um, um, tools and technologies. But what I can tell you is that the traditional approach, um, just in my experience, okay, it doesn't mean that this is not true for somebody else, but in my experience and the other clinical hygienists that I work and teach with, we didn't have much luck with the traditional approach. What do I mean by that? The way that we approach periodontal disease around teeth. You know, I was doing it all. The ultrasonic scaling with the blue, with the blue tip, taking my instruments, you know, vertical strokes, strokes going to town. Because at that time, in 2015, I didn't know anything about the, um, the structure of the implant, the implant surface. I didn't really know about threads. You know, I didn't have good critical thinking skills. Um, but the, the traditional approach of scaling and root planing, arrestin and chlorhexidine solution, that wasn't working for me and my patients. And also I tried so many different um, uh, scalers, but you've got to, you, you have to realize that I'm telling you, there's almost not one implant patient that is the same. The design of the restorations are different. The implants are placed. I mean, it's, it's like really, um, you never get the same patient twice almost. So one trouble that I was having with these scalers is that they were basically, you know, just your traditional scalers dipped in titanium until I found LM Dental Implant Series. And I use these instruments more um, like a diagnostic tool because one thing that traditional um, instruments were lacking was um, length in the shank because sometimes those the, the restorations are so deep sometimes they're bulky we need long um, shanks with lots of contra angles and these are minis right these are mini gracies so they could fit right in between those threads so I like to use these more more of um, diagnostic, especially when a patient comes back, uh, comes in for an implant final check, and I know that it's um, the crown has been cemented. And since you cannot see mesial and distal on a two-dimensional film, you've got to be able to um, effectively and, fit and efficiently go 360 around the margins of that restoration to detect crown. Uh, if there's any residual cement. So I do appreciate LM Dental for their out of the box thinking when they, when they design these instruments. And there is a special there, I'm sorry. Um, they're doing something exclusive just for our attendees that are here with us today. You can get one free LM ErgoMix instruments with the purchase of any three LM ErgoMix instruments by using code HEALY. All right, so implant dentistry is innovative, right? And we know that we have to consider clinical expertise, evidence, and the best interests of our patients because that is the five-step approach to evidence-based practice. But is it realistic, okay? Is it realistic for our patients? Is it realistic for you as a clinician? Um, because things are, things have innovated in dentistry, but I feel like hygienists have been left out in the innovation. There's, there's nothing traditional about the way dental implants are being surgically placed, restored. Man, um, total digital workflow. There's nothing traditional about that. It's all innovative. So for my doctors who are with us today, you know, if you are progressing and adopting all of these new technologies, just know that it must be the same for your dental hygiene department as well. And just remember our purpose, right? We know, especially today, we know that it should be clear that dental hygiene is an, ex an important essential profession, right? That specializes in prevention 
and in the initial treatment of periodontal problems. So let's stop. If you want your patients to um, take their appointments seriously, stop calling it just a cleaning. It's supportive periodontal care, it's, it's assessment and prevention, dental hygiene care, anything but just a cleaning. Because it's all about purpose, right? And, our, and, and, our, and we are preventative specialists. And also, I also wanna take a, a moment to talk about how we're supposed to be working as, as dental teams, and that's intraprofessionally. And that's something that we preach and we, we definitely don't practice. So if you go on the ADA's website, they list the, um, the, the nine specialties or they list the specialties of dentistry and general dentistry is not listed as a specialty. And the re reason why is because um, general dentists are kind of like, um, you know, the, the, the gateway, right? To um, being able to set the patient up with the best dental team. What do I mean by that? If you are presented with a patient and let's say they have a toothache that you cannot give them an answer to, you are able to refer them to the endodontist. If you have an unruly child in your chair that you can't get to cooperate with you, you can refer them to the pa pediatric office. If you have a patient in the chair um, with a periodontal abscess, right, or whatever, it is. You get to refer them to somebody who you know can better serve them because that's our responsibility. That's actually an oath that we take. Well, what are hygienists supposed to do? So if you if you have a if you're a hygienist and um, and practice and, and you're seeing patients with dental implants, but you don't have the knowledge, skill, or um, you know equipment to effectively treat them, what are your options? I think that I believe that dental hygienists need to be working interprofessionally, just like doctors do. And that's what I do. That's how I practice. I work interprofessionally and I share patients with other dental offices. So it can be done because it's, it's being done. And um, the implant care practitioner is somebody who is a, is a dental hygienist that is designed to specifically care for those kinds of patients with full mouth or just dental implant complications. Um, but we need to see ourselves as as specialists. If you're a dental hygienist and periodont uh, working with a periodontist, you, you are a periodontal therapist. If you are a, if you're working in pediatrics, you have the ability to, um, you know, become a myofunctional therapist. You know, we need to start just thinking outside of the box. And if I had more time on my hands, I would be trying to figure out how to get um, dental hygienists into uh, orthodontic practices. So the future of dentist, the future of dental hygiene is now, um, you know, dental hygienists, we have to think of ourselves as more than just being a dental hygienist. And it's not just about plaque. It's, it's specifically about oral biofilm being a deadly bacteria. Um, and stop saying cleaning. It's, it's therapy, it's debridement, it's biofilm management. And this is all centered behind your dental ethics and the kind of healthcare professional you are. But dental hygienists, we are, we, this is preventative and non-surgical dentistry, right? And then I just wanna say, if dentists are going to be placing implants, then they have to give their dental hygienists the proper equipment to keep them clean. Um, we have a Facebook group, the uh, dental, dental Implants Uncovered Study Group. Look for it on Facebook. Join it. We're doing our best to give the latest um, education um, about just all things advanced dental hygiene. Um, so how are you managing dental implant complications in your practice? Because remember, it's not about plaque. It's about controlling the biofilm, reducing inflammation, and promoting healing. I would love to be able to talk to you about all three of these innovations, but I will go over time. So in the interest of time, I just wanna focus on something that's key and that's maintenance, right? So innovations in preventative and non-surgical dentistry, dental hygienists are using soft tissue lasers to treat periodontal disease and implantitis. We're using periodontal endoscopy to be able to remove residual cement um, from, from implant sites. So that is, is great for our patients who don't want to have surgery. So there are these tools and technologies that give dental hygienists the ability to diagnose, 
maintain and treat diseases at a advanced, almost microscopic level. But I wanna focus on the second one there, um, the center of it all, which is maintenance. So we have um, uh, these devices on the scene, dental hygienists, we're talking about, you know, air polisher versus powder streaming device, what to call it, how to properly ex um, describe it. But um, it's important to be able to distinguish between the true because air polishers cannot be used on um, dental implants because they, uh, the kind of pow powder that gets placed inside the implants. One moment, please. Sorry, that is my, my little niece. That's my, my dog. Um, so the um, air polisher devices can only fit uh, uh, sodium bicarbonate. And that can, that's too abrasive for not only implants, but natural teeth as well. And their main function really was for stain removal. Um, your powder string devices or your, um, you might be hearing GBT, or um, EMS is really, we're gonna talk about EMS in a second, but um, there's, there's all these, there are different kinds of devices and there are different manufacturers. My hands-on experience is with the Acteon Airingo. Um, and that's what I'm using down here in this video here. And then we have Melissa Obratka up in the um, corner here. She's actually using the um, Max, uh, Master Prophylaxis device from, from EMS. So this is, this is what's being recommending for the, the best way to be able to decontaminate. Because remember, it's not about plaque, it's about biofilm and we can't see biofilm. So that's why we have to bring back disclosing. That's why we have to incorporate um, GBT into our practices. And here's a paper if you need more information or, or support uh, from the research about it. This is an evidence overview that was published um, uh, by a research dental hygiene group from the Netherlands. It has over 97 references and I will just sum it up for you. And that is that um, um, the most suitable device for an implant surface is a powder streaming device. So the recommendation today is the um, uh, device that is man uh, made or available through um, EMS or Hugh Freedy. This is the first generation. Here's the second generation. And here's the granddaddy, the only one that you need to be concerned about. And that is their master prophylaxis. And what is GBT? GBT is an eight step protocol um, that actually we learn in dental hygiene school. And the prophylaxis master is um, a machine that can either come tabletop or on the cart here. I do recommend the cart. The cart is the one that I have for convenience. It has wheels on it. It can be wheeled around the office. Doctors can use this for their open debridement surgery. So this is something that both hygienists and doctor can benefit from. And you have to jump on board here because practices are picking up on this um, and patients are starting to learn about the best technologies as well. So we will check out this video here. Just give me one second. I've got a lot of animations in my presentations, but I do want this video to play. Okay.
awesome technology. Not only is it standard of care for the maintenance of dental implants, but I think it should just be standard in care, period, because it's the only way to effective, completely debride and get to the biofilm. And manual instrumentation, uh, these are the kind of patients that I serve. Um, an instrument would be subpar care in a situation like this. So again, it's more than just um, plaque and cleaning. And I'm here to tell you that the standard of care for implant maintenance is and should be GBT. And when we talk about the future of dentistry, these things really aren't innovations. It's about adopting technologies because the, the diode lasers or the, or the lasers have been here since 1990s. The periodontal endoscopy came out in 2000, in the 2000s. And we've had this powder stream technology since 2005. And um, I do want to give some time for questions. And one thing that I do want to say about home care, though, is that it needs to be realistic. And we need to stop recommending this 360 flossing technique. Um, it doesn't matter if the implant surface is rough. We also have to consider the perimucosal seal. I'll show you an example of what I'm talking about. But since 2012, even me, myself, unknowingly have been recommending this um, uh, uh, home care regimen for my patients. And still I started meeting patients and patients started coming back to me with um, infection. And upon further examination, right, because I do have a periodontal endoscope, Um, in many cases, there was residual floss. Or before I had the scope, the patient would need open environment surgery, and I would say to the doctor, what did you find, what did you find? And he would say, these little blue and white fuzzy things stuck around the implants. But at that time, I didn't think, I didn't make the connection that, oh my goodness, it's, it might be super floss. So this is another um, example of a, a case where the patient was instructed, this is um, a study of one clinical case, where the patient was instructed to use the 360 flossing technique. I'm talking specifically about this technique. And it doesn't matter what kind of floss you use. It doesn't matter if it's wax, unwax, it doesn't matter. Just don't, don't recommend it for your patients. That's my opinion. And I, like I said, it's because of what I've seen in my own situations with recommending this technique to my patients unknowingly, but now I know. So this is a, a video of a patient that came in. This is implant site number 30, mesial buckle. That's the only area where she had pus bleeding and exudate. And she told me that she was instructed by her endodontist to take wax floss, tie it in a knot, and wrap it 360 um, around her dental implant. So um, I had to... Um, uh, make an educated guess that she probably has floss there. So of course I removed it and I, 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 haven't, I haven't seen her, seen her since. And it's, we've known this since 1983. This was published in the Journal of American, uh, um, uh, the ADA Journal, that uh, floss fragments getting stuck, even if it's around a natural tooth, will cause um, um, an infection. So just remember that there's five steps to evidence-based practice, okay? And you know, one of the most important things is to use, our, use your judgment because, like I said, a lot of the literature is lacking. And I don't know why we're still recommending, you know, flossing in general. We know it's difficult for our patients to do. We know that interdental brushes are superior over um, flossing. It's easier for our patients. Um, and we've got to be open-minded to specialty brushes. Some, high, some clinicians say that they, they will continue to recommend this 360 flossing technique because it's the only way to get to the buckle, sur su buckle surface. Well, that's not true. We have specialty brushes. Um, and then, you know, specialty brushes are really great for soft and hard tissue um, defects. You know, just is just an example of how specialty brush is really great for getting above those um, bulky restorations and into the implant crown. So because of that, because of the possibility of um, floss-induced peri-implantitis, um, I, I recommend um, specialty brushes because I know it's not going to um, risk, you know, uh, any particles getting trapped. Um, I know that the patient won't be tampering with the perimucosal seal. And um, for patients who rather 
use an aerial or, aer or oral gator, that's fine too, because we know it's safe for cement retained restorations. So you can take a screenshot of this. Um, I know that uh, in hygiene, we're kind of up to speed on um, these interdental brushes, but this is the brand. This is my favorite brand. Um, we are offering a code for the practice box because a lot of times hygienists are stuck buying their own um, tools and equipment. So we wanted to help help you and give you an incentive. So this, this code brings the practice box down to about 30 or $40. And then they have this really cool app where you can actually send right to the patient their e email the interdental brushes that you are um, recommending for them. But again, are these innovations? Because oral irrigating has been, or oral irrigators have been here since 1962, um, interdental brushes, 1976, and specialty brushes, 1980. So it's really a matter of adopting technologies. But most importantly, true individualized care, okay? We, we, I know what it's like. I've been in practice myself. The time restraints, you got to fight for it. All right, because our patients have to have the education, the tools, and the practice and the training to be able to um, maintain their very expensive uh, dentistry at home. So implantitis, there's an emphasis on maintenance. Um, you know, we've got to think of a new standard of care, biofilm management. Most patients, depending on their need, should really be seen um, one every one to two months. When it comes to actually treating disease, there's something called the cumulative interceptive supportive therapy or the cyst approach. You can Google that. But basically what that talks about is more frequent visits. So with scaling and root planings, we, um, we do what we need to do and then we see them back in a month. It's not the case with peri-implant disease. Remember, it's such a larger um, infection. And so I just want to close out <laughs> by um, acknowledging and thanking the American Academy of Periodontology and the European Federation of Periodontology on their statements that they made about, you know, um, patient care being a personalized approach and how essential that is um, and how everything should be based on the individual. Individual, individual need. Well, hallelujah, because that's what dental hygienists have been preaching and, and, and you know, screaming forever and advocating forever. So the future of dentistry is now, and when it comes to professional and at-home maintenance for the dental implant population, it needs to be realistic. So we have these three major keys, and that is implantitis is a global concern. It's not in the dental hygiene curriculum, and there's a traditional approach. I'm not somebody who presents problems without a solution. Um, that's why I uh, have cultivated the implant care practitioner and we can make this very successful is if we advocate um, for interprofessional collaboration um, and I've created hands-on programs okay again I don't present problems without solutions I've got these hand-on programs where both hygienists and doctors can come and we give hands-on training on um, all three of those latest technologies, as well as um, we get to learn and fellowship in an intimate space um, and talk about being around like-minded people. So I know there's a lot happening in the world right now. I do wanna encourage you to keep the faith. Um, you know, faith is the ability to see things that don't yet exist, and there's a light at the end of the tunnel. So what you can do during this time is you can concentrate on how are you you going to re-emerge, and I hope that's better than before, right? And just take a break, okay? The U.S. Department of Health and Human Sciences um, did this mental health awareness when, you know, the um, pandemic first came out. Take a break from all of it. Read a book, go outside, learn more about dental implants. And just remember, for our doctors on the call, um, if you're going to be placing implants, then you have to give your dental hygienist the proper equipment to keep them clean. And that is a quote from um, one of our colleagues, Carmen Lanaway, who is a a hygienist practice in Germany. So if you'd like to stay connected, check out the Facebook page. You can also email me at srhrdh at gmail.com. Thank you again, Plan Eka. Thank you everyone for spending your Friday afternoon with me. And don't forget to check out this special offer um, created just for you today. And I will take some questions. Thank you so much, Giovanna, on behalf of Plan Mecca. Um, you, you do better when you know better, and I believe we've all really learned a lot today. Um, I've posted the 
a CE survey link and code, but as a reminder, this will be sent to you along with the offer for LM Instruments uh, early next week and the recording just in case there's something else that you want to reference. Um, and I'll, we can go over the questions that we've received. The first question was, is it okay to use regular instruments on implants? A periodontist told me gentle use is okay. Please confirm. So here's how I need to answer this. It, it depends on if that's all you have, okay? It depends on what you're trying to do. So are you, what's the cause of the problem? Um, are you trying to re remove cement? Is there biofilm? Because if you don't have a hard deposit like cement or calculus, do, then you're not going to really be as effective with just a manual instrument. You really do need to use ult ultrasonic instrument in collaboration as well. But if it's just maintenance, if it's a healthy implant, you, you don't need to touch the implant surface if there's, if there's nothing there. You don't need to touch the surface if it's a healthy situation. Um, it's not okay to use a regular implant, a regular instrument on an implant. However, if that's all that you have and there's cement or calculus, get it off because obviously that would be more damaging um, just to leave it there. I hope that helps. Okay. The next question is, do you know anything about zirconium implants? I learned they are more biocompatible than titanium implants. They are bio, more, bi thank you for that question. They are more um, biocompatible um, because the biofilm doesn't stick, right? And then the tissue, they, they work very well uh, cosmetically in the aesthetic area. Doctors prefer to put some type of a zirconia material there. But it, it's not so much the implants that are zirconia. The implants are still titanium, but it's the, um, it's the abutment that might be zirconia if it's in a um, aesthetic zone. Now, Implants in the posterior zirconia still are not being placed, to my knowledge, by doctors unless the patient has a definite allergy to titanium because zirconia, although it's beautiful, it's kind of like glass. Um, so it's very, um, 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 you know, risky to have some type of a complication because they're just not as strong as titanium implants. So, and there's also not, a, not enough long-term studies on them either. I don't think we have anything more than five years on zirconia implants. I hope that helped. Next question is, how can we treat peri-implantitis if we don't have these gadgets? You have to talk to your doctor about getting the gadgets, <laughs> educate them. Um, or if you are a doctor, uh, maybe you consider you can consider getting some of these gadgets. Then you shouldn't be treating them because, you know, like I said, um, our responsibility is is to the longevity of whatever it is that we're doing for our patients. So if you're going to be placing them, if you're going to be seeing patients who have them, it's your responsibility to equip them. So if it's not in your office maybe you can work interprofessionally with an office close by that does. And just think about how that would take the burden off of you. You know, it's, it's just like this person, you're sharing the responsibility of their, you know, overall health with, you know, your, your colleague there. To me, that takes the pressure off, that takes the responsibility off, and it's, it's always good to have help. I hope that helps. We have another question on, what do you think about mini dental implants? What I know about mini dental implants is that they are temporary. They are temporary. They're not meant to be long-term. Um, also, sometimes they are placed in areas where there's, you know, um, lack of bone, this, that, and the other. But um, when I talk to these, the specialists who are redoing dental implants, um, because I'm not a dentist, I just want to remind everybody that I'm a hygienist. But I think like a dentist. Um, they, um, they're meant to be temporary. I hope that helps. We've had several questions on the name of the Facebook group, and I want to make sure I got it right for everyone. It's Dental Implants Uncovered Study Group. Yes, and I can put that in the chat too. Yeah, please join that. Um, we actually go live every Monday night. 
Um, and we talk about all things advanced dental hygiene and we bring doctors on the show as well. So make sure you join the group. Any other questions? I don't have any more. Just want to remind everyone that to watch for the email early next week, it will have the link again for the CE survey with the code and a recording of Siobhan's webinar. So you can follow up uh, with her contact information, any of the offers, any of the documentation that she had there. And on behalf of Plan Mecca, I would like to thank Siobhan Healy once again for giving us an excellent program and have everyone enjoy their weekend. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.